Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just brought part three of The Naked Truth, the same sex question. Welcome, Pastor Ken. Thanks. Okay, so your question brought a lot of questions. Uh, um, and that. so we are going to be, I'm gonna summarize as many of them as I can, but I will be reading some of the direct questions okay. as well. Um, want to start with one um, that has come in actually every week. Um, and the first one is around uh, masturbation. Is masturbation a sin? Well, let me point us back to the postscript that we did two weeks ago, because I, I dealt mm -hmm. with that. So go watch that. That way we can move on to some of these okay. more current. All right, so and, some, and starting in the ones that really address the bulk of what you talked about today, sure. um, the first one being around love versus lust. So you talked about attraction, you talked about lust being a sin. Mm -hmm. And this person asked, if lust is a sin, how can you tell the difference between love and lust. Well, it has everything to do with sacrifice. Love has to do with self-giving and dying to ourself for the sake of the other person. Even as Christ gave up his life for the sake of the church, and Pastor Dan's going to come and talk about this in, in marriage uh, next week, lust is selfish. It's what I want, how I want it, you know, and, and it's, it's all about me and what's going to make me feel better. It has nothing to do uh, with the other. Good. That's a good clarification. Um, so this question came in around Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and the question is that we see in the Bible with Lot um, speaking of a strongly homosexually practicing community of Sodom, um, that when God deals with this, he deals with it in a very dramatic way, um, setting fire and destroying it. Sure. Is there a explanation of this difference of treatment than with other sins? Sure. Well, let's remember that back here in the start of the Bible, God deals in very dramatic ways lots of times. I mean, just a few chapters earlier, you have Noah and this Wipes it all. <laughs> wild, wide flood. So there was a lot of <laughs> drama when the Bible starts. Let's, uh, I, I, I think though, while certainly homosexuality was a problem uh, in this passage that you're referring to, um, we probably have not done ourselves a, 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 have done ourselves a disservice by taking uh, the word Sodom and actually using it and, and turning it into a word like sodomize. Um, I think we would do better than hyper-focusing on this and trying to convince ourselves there really is a totem pole of sins mm -hmm. uh, in a world that was just perpetually fallen after Adam and Eve. We would do better to move to the New Testament mm -hmm. and to our text today, among others, where we see what I tried to make clear, well, homosexuality is mentioned, uh, but it is not set in its own list. And, and I think that's the way that we, as New Testament people, need to be addressing it nowadays. Good. Um, so I've heard the argument that the Bible only refers to things like orgies and heathenist homosexual acts when condemning homosexuality and not monogamous homosexual relationships. Is there any truth to this? I do not see that. Um, I'm aware of this, we'll, we'll call it kind of a new hermeneutic, and, and that's just a fancy word for interpretation, application um, of what the Bible is saying. I'm certainly aware of it, and it is certainly uh, caught on in the church here in the last, I don't know, decade or so. I think the, the shortcoming of this interpretation and application is as follows. You don't have uh, the history of the church 
standing with you. Um, you have 2,000 years of us saying, well, no, this wasn't in bounds. And now you're saying it is in bounds because we didn't ever understand the text. Now, some would push back and say, well, isn't that what happened with women? And now we let women have more of the normal you know, rights and equality and we treat them different and, and, uh, and slavery. We're not for slavery anymore, and, and people throughout history even built a case for, for slavery using the Bible. And so you says, yeah, but I think what you have to look at is the trajectory of Scripture. If we're going to be honest and look at wh what was the trajectory when you look at the way that Jesus was dealing with women and Paul was dealing with women, you see that they were both moving in this direction of great grace and expansion of the understandings of what people understood to be normative uh, back then. So they were shattering uh, the normal uh, s sort of stereotypes. Same with uh, s slavery. Uh, t t I think you can see that while nowhere was Paul ever advocating slavery, but rather when he does mention it, he was trying to move them to a deeper understanding of, hey, regardless of what status is yours, if you're a slave, then why don't you serve Christ with all of your heart, as if not serving a man, but as of serving God. But you look at the trajectory of his writings and of Jesus' teachings, and you see he was always moving towards greater grace, greater inclusiveness, greater um, expansiveness. And so I think when people, you know, in the 1800s uh, talked about how slavery, you know, you, it's biblical. They were, they were doing a, 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 a disservice to really the trajectory that Paul was moving people by the end of his life in God's written word. Now, conversely, you take the subject of sexuality, and we know that just from secular history that people in Corinth, they'd figured out all sorts of wild and wacky ways to, to be sexually active. I talked about that in the sermon. But in Corinthians and in every New Testament book, you see the opposite is happening than ever happened with women, than ever happened with slavery. There was always a drawing in. The Christian was being led to an understanding. Okay, now on this one, you've been way too loose. And so, whereas these subjects, you need to have a deeper understanding of appropriateness and of grace. And, uh, but on this subject, the subject of sexuality, we're going to have to draw that one in. And I think this new hermeneutic uh, overlooks that reality of a trajectory and, and why I can't stand with, with, with that. So let me ask you a follow-up question. Uh, for the Bible teachers, authors, pastors, theologians who are subscribing to this new hermeneutic, new um, would you call them heretics? Would you throw out their material? Well, look, I, Pastor Dan and I have a similar story in that we had a professor years ago in seminary who just absolutely transformed our lives and many students. He was just wonderful. And just, just like every sentence he would say, it was like, oh my gosh, that's so good too. Let me write that down. And years after we had graduated, and but before this man would die of old age, uh, the reality came out that he had been in an extramarital affair mm. for some time. I remember Dan and I were so befuddled by that, and we're like, what? How can this man have got? Does that just mean we just need to take every note we ever took and just trash it and burn it? And, and where we had to finally conclude is, no, where he gave us good counsel, he gave us great counsel. And he, he still was a marvelous teacher and taught us so much of what God's word was saying. In an area of his own personal life, he was off. And so, even though we never either got to talk to him again, we just had to sort of forgive him for that. But we continue to take the, the truth of everything that he taught us. I think that that could be said of uh, 
authors today who are coming out and sort of uh, maybe switching positions and saying, I'm going to embrace the new hermeneutic uh, and all. Does that mean that we just trash everything that they ever wrote before that? Well, in many instances, I think it was good stuff. It was biblical and it was sound. And I think to the extent that a person can, uh, you know, ch chew the watermelon and spit out the seeds, uh, we can continue to, to encourage, hey, not on this book, but on these, there's a lot of good things there. I think where we run the risk, if we don't say anything uh, to put up a, a red flag or at least a yellow flag, is that unknowing newer believers, younger Christians come in and they, they start with one of those books and then they say, I really like this Absolutely author. Good. I'm gonna go down the pike and just read everything he or she ever wrote. I think that's where we can get into trouble and where we owe it to our con congregation to say, okay, this is gonna be a problem though if you get to this book because we don't see this as standing in consistency with, with where God's word is and where the church has, has stood. Good. Um, so we talked about this biblical translation and um, hermeneutic, um, but let's talk a little bit about what Jesus has said about homosexuality. Um, this person wrote in and said, my brother is gay, and he always comments that Jesus never specifically says homosexuality is a sin. I know what Jesus says about marriage, but he doesn't see that as Jesus being against homosexuality. What do I say? Well, see, but th to, to start there is to assume that Jesus was all about creating lists of inbounds and out of bounds. No, what he was doing is he was stepping into the continuum of history and to a lot of what was already written in God's word and going back to the very beginning in Genesis, Adam and Eve, and male and female, they'll, they'll be created in His image, and the two shall become one flesh, um, and, and leave and cleave, and they'll become one flesh. And, and so He didn't say anything because He didn't have to. It was just a foregone conclusion. And uh, so I think we have to, to, to back up and uh, be careful about trying to be legalistic in the flip direction saying anything that he didn't ever say no to is therefore a yes, or anything he didn't say yes to, uh, you know, the other way around. Uh, th there was plenty of the story that had already come in that he was just stepping into and giving interpretation a deeper meaning uh, at, at that point. That's good. Um, so you said something that raised um, quite, a, quite a few questions. Um, so you said that uh, those who have same-sex attraction are wired differently. Does that suggest a genetic connection? Um, you know, this person has a close family member who has always felt this way. Um, there's a lot of confusion around, are you born gay? Are you not born gay? Sure. Um, what, explain yeah. that. Well, and there's a lot of you know, I mean, the same could be said about somebody who's alcoholic. I think I mentioned that one. Uh, where did they get that propensity or gene? Is it from the mom, from the dad, from the grandparents? Did it skip a generation and this sort of thing? And, well, you can get lost in the, the detail of all of that. Uh, and I suppose, you know, maybe the day would come out that they would find a gene that is the, the gay gene. Um, but for that matter, maybe they'll find the gene that is the pride gene or the greed gene or the heterosexual porn addict gene. Uh, I mean, I've known plenty of people who would say, for as long as I can remember, I've liked looking at women, you know? Even as a little boy, I liked looking at women. Well, okay. so. That's what you were born with. Let's, let's just say, sure. I don't know if genetic, but it's just the way you're wired. Just like the person that, you know, is a gossip or greeter, you know, any of these sorts of things. All of us are wired in certain ways. The question is not, how did we come into the world and how, how did we naturally start, but what are we doing with how we were naturally wired when we came into the world? Uh, because none of us get to pass, mm -hmm. I mean, born. I could say, you know, I'm just naturally uh, an impatient person. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that can lead to anger. Uh, and just back off. That's just my business. It's just the way I'm wired. It's just the way God made me. Well, no. I mean, well, yeah, yes, but no, I can't just say that and leave it there. That's the part of me that I'm going to have to surrender and take up my cross and say, okay, that, that cannot be what defines me. I'm defined by Jesus, which means I'm going to have to step into a new level of graciousness and patience and, and uh, dealing with fe feelings in ways that, you know, aren't outburstish. So then how do you respond to people that are confused with why a good God would allow them to feel some way that isn't right? Yeah, sure. Well, that's a very real question. And <laughs> I guess in a roundabout way, it's one that all of us wonder about ourselves, right? I mean, I think all of us at the core of what we're talking about here, but in every message really, whether the message is on greed or whether the mes message is on um, pornography or adultery, we're beneath all of that, we're asking, is God really good? And the inference is, if he was really good, I wouldn't feel this. I wouldn't wrestle with this. He wouldn't wrestle with that. She wouldn't wrestle with that. My husband, my wife wouldn't wrestle with that. My child wouldn't be having to deal with that. If God was good, none of that would happen. Well, I do understand that. I really do, and I tried to illustrate that in, in the message uh, with my own son. And, uh, but I think what we have to come to the conclusion of is, no, I'm going to start with the reality of God is good, that much I know, and we are fallen. All of us are fallen. All of us have been affected by this, this, this fallen world that has suffering and has pain. And therefore, the journey starts having established those truths with, now what are we going to do about that? And how are we going to walk faithfully and obediently as best we can? with him. And he's good and he is because good. he sent his son to give us a Certainly. way to be rescued. And we we from always go back to the gospel because the things that we struggle if we're questioning with, only through uh, him. You look at Jesus and say, well, God gave his son. Mm -hmm. So you know he's good. If he wasn't good, he wouldn't have given us a savior. Give us a way out no. to save our to say. Um, so let's talk about um, same sex marriage. We had a lot of questions come in around that. So how do you respond when the question is from a gay friend, so I'm just supposed to be single for the rest of my life? Because God has given the wonderful gift of our sexuality and same-sex attraction is not a sin. However, those of us who have opposite sex attraction do have the avenue of the covenant of marriage. Mm. So why are those with same-sex attraction not able to fulfill their sexuality through marriage? And so the struggle is to grasp why in their normalcy mm. they are denied the loving, committed relationship that those of us with heterosexual attractions can experience. Sure. No, I understand that. That's a, t a tender question and a real question. You know, <laughs> but... I think the assumption even behind the question, we have to be careful, is that everybody else gets to be married. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is I know a lot of people who would have liked to have been married. Uh, but mathematically, what is it? There's, there's like more women in the whole wide world than there are men. Mathematically, it doesn't work. Um, and even if mathematically it did work, you know, some women just never get got asked, and they want it to be. And some men, maybe they asked, and just for whatever reason, it, it the answer was no. And there they are. And so I, th I think we have to be careful ab about making the assumption that uh, everybody who is you know, traveling the path of singleness uh, must have 
drawn the, drawn the short stick and, and, and they're gay. No, there's plenty of people who could share the same feeling. So I think we have to change the subject uh, off of uh, sexual bent, dealing no less with this subject of marriage. And well, what do I do if I'm not going to be married? Well, as you talked about in your sermon so well last week, you looked at Jesus. He's a pretty good example of somebody who was destined to a life of singleness and uh, never took a wife. And uh, you gave us some very good thoughts on that. I'd refer people back to listen uh, to that. And uh, so I think it's applicable here as well. And, and, and community, right? We, we do, well, so sure, maybe you won't have a spouse, and so that's just your reality. But you do have community. And that's where I, uh, again, I loved that book, Ed Shaw's book, uh, The Plausibility Problem, that pastor in England who, who just talks about the rich community that he enjoys in his church with his people. And, and even though the world says it's implausible that you could live this way, he says, but I am living this way. And by God's grace, I am, and I'm fulfilled. And sure, it's not exactly the way I would have liked it. And, and some people have come along and told me it's because you had bad parents. No, I had great parents. Uh, you know, or for this reason or that reason. No, it's, it's really not. It's just kind of what I always felt. But he says it's imp it is plausible for me to, to live a fulfilling life walking hand in hand with brothers and sisters in Christ and pursuing the Lord and carrying our cross, uh, crosses together. So another question around um, same-sex marriage. Would homosexuality be deemed not a sin if it took place within marriage? So within a monogamous same-sex marriage, can that... Does that make it all? Does that make it, okay? make it work then? Well, n no, I don't see any provision in God's word for that. I see how the thinking uh, goes. Well, better than having, you know, people moving around from person to person. At least they just choosing one person. But really that line of logic, I guess, could apply to, to people about having affairs, extramarital affairs, heterosexual affairs. Well, is it okay if they just only have one with one person that they're committed to in that affair outside of their marriage? Well, no, that doesn't all of a sudden make it, th therefore it's a holy affair because the foundation upon which it was built was already in God's word called sin. So I don't think we can do that. Um, you know, there can be some inconsistency around how we even treat sexual sin that we talked about today, but yeah. particularly around divorce, remarriage, mm -hmm. and same-sex marriage. Um, someone wrote in and they said that there seems to be some contradiction mm -hmm. with this uh, week sermon and um, what they see um, the Bible teaching and the church believing about divorce. divorce. Yeah. Um, my understanding of the Bible is that divorce is not recognized by God and that I'm considered still married to my ex-husband. However, I believe the church would not consider a marriage between me and my new husband a sin and it would possibly even officiate the service but I don't think that's true for same-sex couples. So how is it that my sin is different than a same-sex marriage sin? Right, well, that's a very good question and kind of detailed. Uh, let's see if we can break it down. Um, yes, it would be hypocritical if in every instance, when two people, heterosexual people, uh, coming for marriage, having been divorced, were just given a blank check for marriage and said, sure, 
no questions asked, let's move on, while at the same time also telling uh, people who want to be married as gay people together, no way, we're not going to do that. That would be hypocritical. And I'm afraid that in some instances, uh, the ch and maybe in many, the church has uh, not handled this well and has uh, treated the divorce and remarriage situation with a lot more of a blind eye mm -hmm. dealt to it um, than we should. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it's safe to say, and I certainly hope it is, and it's certainly our intention, that that's not the case here at FaithBridge because we sit down with couples that are wanting to marry, and we hear their stories, and we understand uh, what happened and where there was sin that led about that divorce, um, that brought about that divorce. And, and so we've got to deal with that because otherwise you'll just bring all of that dysfunction into your, to your new marriage. And so there's a point, there needs to be a point of real repentance, um, having acknowledged here's where I goofed up and here's where I lost my spouse or my family and this sort of thing and I've repented of that and but here's a person with whom I feel I could make another go of it and I'm there's more of me inside of me now surrendered to Jesus or even aware of Jesus in the first place and I'm ready to take up my cross and live this life in marriage with another person. That's one thing and, and can be good, but in every instance would not necessarily be, uh, you know, appropriate. The problem with the whole gay marriage situation is, again, we're starting with the assumption that if you take two people who are engaged in what the Bible's already said, but that's not ever in bounds that therefore it'll, it makes it better or even right. Well, if you do that and you move into a, a, a gay marriage, as a follower of Jesus, every day you wake up, there, there is not repentance uh, from what was to now what is. You're, you're still living in the, in the what always has been, which is, a foundation that won't support that, not biblically. Um, so that hopefully that. Can, but I would say this: if if uh, that's a long question, and I don't even know if I got to all of it, but I would say two more quick things. Let's get you in community. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to sort all this out by yourself, you need to be in a grow group, and let's get some brothers and sisters around you to help you process these deep thoughts that you're feeling and wondering about and trying to discern. Um, and not just only community, but maybe some one-on-one. -on -one. Let's, you know, give a call up here and let's give you a chance to sit down with Pastor Dan or Beth, somebody just to talk about your story and, and maybe to do some some one-on-one -on -one about that as well. That's good. Um, so we had a question come in um, and quite a few that we're going to process through when it comes to um, being in relationship with other people and how this practically plays out. Um, the first one that came in is how do we as Christians deal with or approach a family who is raising a transgender child? Um, the family feels that God is leading their child towards living as the opposite gender. So how, how do we handle and be in relationship right. with family? Well, I, I think, first of all, realize you aren't the savior. Jesus is the savior. Our job is to, to walk the tightrope between grace and truth, and grace and truth. And so we try to walk that tightrope all the while trying to point people to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the only one who will awaken people to uh, new ways of thinking, new realities, um, and transformation. You can't reach inside somebody and, and say, this is the switch that needs to be flipped. Let me flip it. Well, that's probably never going to happen. Uh, 
and, and so I would say, uh, first of all, let's get them to Jesus. Uh, second of all, you're always navigating, you know, does this conversation need a little more truth or does it need a little bit more grace? Um, and we're always going back and forth. And then finally, we're going to have to leave the results with him. Uh, this is, you know, it could be said of, of any situation because all of us Christians are dealing with people, loved ones that are in differences, not just this kind of situation that you've articulated, but any number of situations that we'd like, I'd really like to change that. Well, ultimately I, I can't. So I'm going to have to, to just trust that God is going to do what only God can do with this. I've tried to be as faithful as I can be. And we, we should be in relationship with people and absolutely. maintain that relationship Absol so the, absolutely. that we because have an you, opportunity. You, you have no potential to affect uh, any change if you break a relationship mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. You've lost your influence. Yeah. Yeah, I think maintaining relationships are so important <clears throat> to be able to have trust. Mm -hmm. And so in this one, um, someone wrote in and said, can't uh, disagree with your message today. It's a very hard teaching in light of today's culture. Um, but the question is around how can we engage in a compassionate and loving yet persuasive way with people and churches who have normalized this? What is the proper response to the inevitable accusations of bigotry that will follow? Well, good question. And but one that makes me a little bit suspicious right here because I, I know the ten tendencies that many of us have, and that is to hear a message like this, and we're like, oh, that that phrased it in a way I've never thought of it. And you know, so so here are the books that I need to give that person, and this settles it once and for all. Uh, you know, game set match, slam dunk, boom. Uh, and so I'm going to dump this all on my gay friends uh, or their gay church, and uh, I'm going to give them 30 days. And if and if they don't, you know, step into the light in 30 days, uh, then I'm going to start posting mean things about them uh, because, well, I I did my best, and you know, well, I think we have to be careful. Um, <laughs> about how do we persuade other people to come into the truth of God's word. We're going to have to trust, again, that Jesus is the Savior. He's the one that transforms. He's the one that changes. We don't get to be that person. We're not the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. Um, and uh, so we're going to have to sit back and trust him going I'd refer this person and all of us to 1 Corinthians 13. Say, you know, probably what we need to focus on is love, 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 love. Um, especially if accused of, of bigotry. I've just got to, I've got to prove them wrong with not my arguments, but with my love. My, love and my, my actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. Um, so... The next question came around, and there was quite a few questions around um, what you would probably or call an affirming church. So how do you suggest Christians address so-called Christian churches, which are not biblically preaching and teaching about homosexuality, or they've gone as far as providing premarital counseling or condoning the marriage of same-sex couples? Um, how do you suggest that we address this with other Christians? Yeah, well, again, uh, yeah, not dissimilar to the previous question, uh, I think we're always going to be uh, trying to ask ourselves, first of all, am I <laughs> the, modeling this with a spirit of love before I have any conversations? And then we're always going to be making sure that we're walking the tightrope between grace and truth compellingly. Um, and pointing people back to Jesus. And, you know, the, the reality is uh, only He transforms, only He changes uh, people and entire churches. Um, and so I, I think that's where we just have to, to, to say, I'm going to leave this in, in His hands. Um, 
if these people have decided this is how they're going to uh, interpret God's word, I can't join them in that. I don't see that um, for the reasons that we've already talked mm-hmm. about uh, uh, above. But I, it's not going to make me turn vitriolic or start lobbing hand grenades. Um, I'm still going to walk as best I can close to Jesus and just pray for them and ask the Lord to help them come into awareness of the truth of his word. So let's talk about, um, like you said today, that almost probably everyone in the room could raise their hand and say, I have a friend, I have a a relative, I have someone who I love very deeply that Mm -hmm. struggles um, with SSA. And so there's a lot of questions around how do we support them. Um, And so a lot of them came around weddings. Um, And so let's talk about weddings. There's questions like, should I participate in someone's wedding? Should I go if I'm invited? Should I be an attendant? Um, The question around being around, could it be viewed as I'm celebrating homosexuality if I go? Or where, how do I draw the line? Yeah, and that's a, that's, (laughs) we all would like clear lines, Mm -hmm. wouldn't we? Um, And this one is very tricky. I would say a couple of things. First, always prefer the relationship to cutting off the relationship. And only you can really know with discerning from the promptings of the Holy Spirit as you've prayed about it, would would what I choose to do here imperil or, or terminate our relationship? Because if I've terminated the relationship, then I, there's there's no... I have no influence in this person's life. Now, there are some Christians who would say, uh, matter-of-factly, straight down the line, there's no way, Jose, I'm not going, can't do it. Held freeze over faster before I go. And if that's where you come down and that's your conviction, then go in peace. Just do that with love, I would say. Um, Make sure that you're living out 1 Corinthians 13 as you try to navigate truth and grace. Others, on the other hand, say, well, they know my convictions about this. Most everybody who's going to be there, they, they, they know where I stand on this, but I prayed about it and I feel like the Lord's saying, you have to be there to be an agent of light, to be an agent of I don't know, maybe conviction. Um, and so I'm going to be there. And it's because I do feel like the Lord's saying, well, then you go in peace. I, I can't prescribe, uh, here's what you must do. Um, I think you'll have to figure that one out as you pray and lean on your community. Who's your grow group? Other brothers and sisters processing it. That they know you better and you're family and the dynamics and whatever. Um, we work that out in community. It's good. Um, so let's talk about um, our church. Someone wrote in um, and said that they've, they've struggled with gluttony um, and no one su- would suggest that they weren't welcome at the church. Um, so would we exclude someone or Really, the question is, would someone who is in an ongoing homosexual relationship be welcome at our church? Absolutely. Right. We, we welcome everybody. Uh, we've got people here who are cohabitating. They just won't ever get around to getting married. We've got people here who are having adulterous affairs we got plenty of proud people and greedy people and gossiping people. and We're just a band of sinners, all of us uh, are. Uh, and so, absolutely, uh, we would just say, come, as I would say to everybody, no matter what their vice, with an openness in your heart and your mind to hearing what God is going to say and responding as he's going to lead you to respond. Well, that's a good question. Um, because the, the another question that came in was, um, how should we as Christians respond to those who are in a homosexual relationship, profess to be followers of Christ, but yet 
don't repent. They go to church um, and they continue to be in their relationship. Um, how do we respond? As well, here again, I, I think we're going back to grace and truth. Uh, we're responding, responding with all the grace that God has shown us, uh, leaning on all the truth of his word, um, trusting that he, Jesus, the Savior, is the only one who can transform mm -hmm. uh, people. And I think we just keep pointing them uh, you know, back to Jesus because Jesus is the one who changes people. That's why I'm always inclined to say, let me just get this person to Jesus. If I could get, to get them to Jesus, then uh, these other things will begin to be addressed, not by me, but by him uh, along the way. Not that they won't have heard me to address them as well, because my conversation, I hope, is seasoned with grace and truth. But it does absolve me from the feeling of responsibility to be the savior myself mm -hmm. and to bring about those changes as if I ever could bring about those changes in somebody else. Yeah. So this last question, um, what about married same-sex couples? What do they do if they become followers of Christ? And I, I ask this not as a theoretical question, but because we had someone write in who was viewing online sure. who this is their story. Yeah. and this is their struggle, sure. what would you say? Well, I would say you're at the right place. Come to Faith Bridge, be a part of Faith Bridge, step into the fellowship of what we call real people, real life. All of us are carrying uh, different burdens, different crosses, and but we're also discovering along the way the, the strength that comes as we bring our hurts, habits, hangups, uh, backgrounds, uh, patterns, whatever they are, and we lean into the benefits and the community of brothers and sisters in Christ carrying uh, those burdens uh, together. Yeah, and I think about what a complex situation this is. There's probably children. There's I'm probably sure. all sorts of things. Sure. Nothing that you can do alone. Nothing that you can wade through alone. Right. And no, you there's need, people here who can... You need community. Mm -hmm. And there's people here who can... Counsel you. And, help you and, mm -hmm. and take the journey with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, I uh, love the two challenges that you left us with today to share our stories, which is one of the best parts about being in community, um, and to love well. And you've given us lots of practical ways to do that. So thank you. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.